something for us to, uh, to celebrate, um, and I want to share with everyone. Uh, besides, we're going to pick a fight. For an Irishman to get in a fight, that's a good idea, okay? I mean, that's, that'll get you excited, okay? But no, what I want to share with you is uh, extraordinary good news. Um, at our Gateway campus, which if anybody doesn't know where it's at, drive 13 miles due south and turn left, okay? And you'll be at the campus. It's right at 13 miles. At that little campus in a community of 500 people, um, we've been averaging about 21, 22 people. Um, last week, uh, they were like uh, 35 and this week, there were a total of 55 in Man Aaron Gateway. We want to praise God for that. Amen? Okay, Stephen is doing a great job down there. He did a great job for filling in for me. Um, I uh, went honeymooning uh, with my wife after 34 years of uh, blissful, sweet marriage. Okay, it's always been good on my end. I don't know about hers. Okay, from my perspective, it's been awesome. And we took time to go, we went to Billings because it was so smoky. Um, we decided just to go do that, and we did nothing. I didn't answer my phone, I didn't do those things. So I want to say thank you guys for uh, letting me do that and uh, celebrate what God has done in our lives. It's always good to go and, and dream new dreams and talk about new things and to celebrate 34 years of, uh, you know, loving the same person. And I know Lisa and I have a unique relationship. Uh, we spend basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week together. You know, if you hear, if you're new here and you see me kiss my secretary, okay, it is approved by God and ordained by the church, okay? I mean, it's all good. Um, but no, she's my secretary, and, you know, we're together all the time. And when we're not together, I miss being together. For it is not good for man to be alone. Amen? Okay. Um, two weeks ago when I preached, I asked this question, are Christians and disciples the same? And I'm going to finish that up because we start into a new series uh, next week. Um, as we look at living and being like Christ and how Christ uh, loved and cares for people. So, um, and it, this question comes out of Acts chapter 2 and, you know, in verse 41, it says, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper in prayer. And I ask that question because, I mean, we think about 3,000 people coming to Christ. I mean, uh, we're celebrating the fact that um, we have 55 in Gateway. Can you imagine 3,000 next Sunday showing up here? I mean, it would be overwhelming, wouldn't it? Okay. Uh, other good news is, is we're going to baptize five people at Gateway. That's the absolute best news, not the number, but the, the fact that people are committing themselves to Christ. And, you know, I, and so I ask that question because what we're seeing in, in our society today is there is this huge divide within the church, okay? Those who call themselves Christians and those who'd say, no, I'm a follower of Christ. Is there a difference? Is being a disciple you know, it, it seems to, that it's just a play on words, but, you know, a disciple literally means it, that person is a learner, a student of someone. They're a learner or a student. The other word would be apprentice, okay? They, and an apprentice in, in Jewish culture would follow somebody around and whatever they did, they would do and learn to do. And we see that in the disciples' lives where they, you know, basically followed Christ for three and a half years. Everywhere he went, they went. But see, the term uh, uh, disciple implies action in this little thing called obedience. And that's where the big 
disconnect seems to come. The term Christian, however, kind of tends to refer to a status, okay? It's a status symbol. It's a, I've got my seat on the bus. I've said the prayer. I've done what was, quote, necessary. You know, it was originally used as a derogatory term to mock first century followers of Christ. It was used to mock them. It was, you know, um, it was seen as not something as a status symbol or something good. Today, for many, the primary requirement for becoming a Christian is the agreement with Christian doctrine. And put whatever flavor of Christianity you want to put there, but the death, burial, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Who believes it? Amen, you're a Christian. Good to go. That is what we've narrowed it down to. It's just an, an agreement with doctrine. Listen, a Christian is, is expected to be something, and a disciple is expected to do something. The shirt that I have on, okay? I'm going to use it as an example. Anybody can wear the thin blue line, can't they? And a lot of people do. But the question is whether or not you're going to back it up by actually putting it into motion. To back up what you say. You know, Christian, guys, listen, needs to mean more than just a place. Just a seat on the bus. See, when Jesus invited people to follow him, he asked them first to come and see. We see that in John chapter 1, the first followers. It says, when John's two disciples heard this, that John had just turned and saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. When they heard this, uh, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. They replied, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. It was about the fourth, four o'clock that afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. Then a little later on, he called them to come and follow. Matthew 4. One day, Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to be fishers of men. See, these calls of Christ required a physical response, an active response, not one, a passive, I've raised my hand, I've done, I've asked the right question, I said the, no, it required them to move forward. You see, they became the disciples, and that's what we call them, the disciples of Christ. You see, there's a built-in expectation that disciples do something. They just don't wear the T-shirt. The more I've, I have read this, this uh, over this last week, the Scottish writer uh, George MacDonald, he writes this in explaining the, the, this difference well. He said, instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, ask yourself whether you have this day done one thing, one thing, because Jesus said to do it, or once abstained, because Jesus said, don't do it. It is simple, simply absurd to say you believe or even want to believe in him if you, do, if you do not do anything he tells you. If we're not putting into action what he's called us to do, not doing what he's called us not to do. You know, biblically we can say, that all who actively follow Jesus, those who would call themselves disciples, also believe in Him, and that their belief is sufficient for their salvation. It's sufficient for their salvation. So I think it's safe to say that every disciple is a Christian. But I have to be honest, I don't think every Christian is a disciple. 
I don't think everyone who actually claims the name of Jesus is going to enter into the kingdom of God. And I know these are harsh realities. In the gospel of Mark, Luke and John, Jesus teaches a gospel really of, of repentance and a call to follow and a call to do and a call to be. Then we come to the gospel of John, and that's where I spent my time last week. In the gospel of John, uh, John focuses on love and belief. But listen, both cases, whether it's the other gospels or the gospel of John, the call is still the same. We're still called to believe. We're called to love and to serve and to help others. Or listen, we're not in the body of Christ. We are not followers of Jesus. You know, some use the term nominal Christian. You know, those who are Christian in name. I want you to know that is not a biblical principle. There are no nominal Christians in the Bible. James, the brother of Jesus, said this, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. He says, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Wow. How foolish, can you, how foolish can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? See, he takes the nominal right out of it. And for too many of us, we settle for being just a nominal Christian. That we can attend church and check certain boxes and believe certain things, and we're good to go. We looked last week and saw that, that, the, that Jesus didn't teach that. He taught a, a gospel of, of act, active, actively following and actively becoming. Now we're going to look at the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. No, the Apostle Paul clearly emphasizes um, one becoming a Christian by faith and not by works. Anybody else praise God for that? Okay, because listen, we can't work hard enough to get into, into heaven. In Romans uh, 3.28, it says, So we are made right with God through faith and not by, by obeying the law. He makes it clear that no one's going to ever earn their way into heaven. Does Paul, though, equate belief with being a disciple. Does he equate it? Does he, does he really just leave it there? That we are saved by faith through faith. Or saved by, by faith through grace. Or by grace we are saved through faith. Is that the end of it? Listen, I, I don't believe so. Based on his account in Galatians, um, we learn that Jesus taught the Apostle Paul himself the gospel. In Galatians 1.12, Paul writes, I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul also, also taught the same thing that Jesus taught. Paul met with the disciples in Jerusalem. So we would have known about Jesus' command to follow him and to make disciples throughout the entire earth. Paul wrote in Romans, or wrote Romans around the same time that the Gospels were written. So we would have written Romans with full knowledge of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't go out on his own, and he didn't alter, and he would not alter the Gospels he presented it to the Gentiles. He preached the same gospel that he was taught by Christ himself and that he was also instructed by through the, through the, the 12 or the 11. Listen, this is important for us. Paul said, Let's, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news or gospel than the one we preach to you. The gospel doesn't change, and it must not change. You see, some have tried to, to drive a wedge, if you will, between uh, what Paul taught and what Jesus taught, that Paul had a fuller revelation somehow than Jesus Christ himself. 
Robert, and I cannot pronounce this guy's last name, so we're just going to call him Robert, okay? He's got one of those hard ones. It's P-I-C-I-R-I-L-L-I-S. Yeah, it's a hard name, okay? It can't be simple. Smith, I wish we would just keep them simple. But he writes in, in his book, Expressions of Saving Faith, he says, Paul's transactional model teaches that if people believe on Christ alone, they are saved. This model has been elevated in the modern church culture to be the pristine, time-proven way of salvation. Some assume in its greatest support are Paul's letters to Romans and Galatians, and its greatest champions are Reformed Protestant churches. The transactional model describes salvation as primary, primarily a judicial decision that is settled for good. Did you get that? In other words, it's a judicial decision. Listen, our sins are paid for by the blood of Christ. Amen? He became our propitiation. That is a judicial action that's taken place. And all that what Paul, all this guy is saying, and he's a reformed writer, is that all we have to do is believe. Well, if that's the case, then the devil's going to heaven too. Did you realize that? We just read that in James. And for many in the church, we have just been teaching, just believe, just believe, just believe. Listen, do we have to believe? Absolutely. But is there any fruit to your belief? You see, justification is a key aspect of the gospel. But the weakness of this transactional model is that the gospel is preached without a call to follow, without a call to become a disciple of Christ, a call for life transformation. It's preached with an easy believism. And they try to justify it with Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. They try to justify it, but this is not what Paul taught and what he even spoke about. Paul speaks consistently and repeatedly that if we are Christians, that, that we have a necessity for training and for discipleship and for spiritual growth and for transformation to take place in our lives. He encourages the, his readers over and over. In 1 Corinthians 9 Verses 24 and 27, he says, Don't you realize that in a race everyone don't you realize that in a race race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplining, disciplined in their training. They they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself would be disqualified. You see, he's encouraging us that, that it's just not about, quote, believing. And I'm done. I sit and maybe hold a pew down or hope that someday I get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. In Philippians 4.19, he says, Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then God of peace will be with you. You see, there's this call to action. Paul was clear that it, is, that it was his work to teach and to exhort everyone to grow up into Christ. Are you becoming like him? Are you growing up into him? Or are you just the same old you? In Galatians 4.19, it says, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I am going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. The call for us to become like Christ we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. You see, Paul calls us to an act of faith. Not just a passive belief, but an act of faith that, that is transforming our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
In Romans 12, we see Paul beginning to emphasize this point and that he describes it clearly, clearly as discipleship. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen, he's speaking of us becoming like laying our lives down as acceptable sacrifices because we have been transformed by the power of the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Listen, Paul also teaches that we're to be accountable and that we're to help others. Those who are rebellious and unruly and timid and weak. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Talking about a transformation and the fact that, that, that one of my jobs, one of your jobs is, is when we see someone who is, who is practicing just an easy believism and is not striving to become like Christ, that we encourage them. Those who aren't serving and loving and becoming like Christ, that we would encourage them and, and instruct them. Listen, Paul also teaches the importance of spreading the gospel. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. The importance of us becoming like Christ and passing it on. We call that discipleship. We call that mentorship. Listen, though they use different terms to express the same thing, Paul teaches what Jesus taught. That the gospel is active and that discipleship is essential for the true believer. Not just a, a program that happens, but something that is continuous ongoing in our lives. When Paul teaches justification by faith alone and Christ alone, he is also teaching that the life of a disciple is the fruit of our salvation. That it is not just a one and done. That it's an ongoing process in our lives. Listen, so what's been the, 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 the result of this divide in the church over the years? In recent years, Christians have been truly divided into two categories. At the core of this division, the idea of salvation has two parts. Okay, first, a person receives Christ as Savior. Praise God, amen, you're done, you've believed, you've been baptized, it's over. Listen, that's where so many Christians are living right now. Then sometime later, they submit to Him as Lord. They begin to follow, they begin to, to serve, they begin to understand. Now listen, is there a time period of, of, uh, for, for things to take place? Absolutely. But if it lingers on for months and years and in some cases for decades, let me ask, are you truly, are you truly a follower of Christ? Listen, this understanding has led to an existence of a two-tiered Christian uh, population. You have those that are radical and believe and are following and serving and I'll be honest, the rest of the world does everything, including the church, to drag those out of that state and bring them back to the easy believism. Listen, this two-tiered system has created um, an expectation that many Christians will languish for years just, just in that belief state. But that goes against what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught about the gospel, that it would multiply, that it would bear 30, 60, and even 100 fold in a person's life. Now listen, Jesus said in Matthew 13, listen to the expectation of the parable about the farmer planting seed. The seed that fell 
on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and, and did not understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The second on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Oh, I believe. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted or for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is <coughs> crowded out by the worries of life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and pronounce a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as has been planted. So where are you? Are you good soil that's producing fruit and it's obvious for everyone to see? Because see, listen, fruit is obvious. I have an apple tree in my back. I have two. I have one that has maybe six apples on it. I have one who has 6,000 apples on it. And it's there for everybody to see. Listen, what's, what's being produced in your life? Because we expect this, we create and have, have programs that don't make people feel pressure because we're afraid of this little thing called legalism. Listen, legalism has no place in the church. Has no place in the church. Legalism is nothing more than a list you check off to make sure that you're on the bus. But listen, true discipleship and a commitment to Christ are only those who are in the bus and are in the church and those who are active in their faith. We have to be careful that we don't dumb down Christianity to the point that we no longer expect anything from those who call on the name of Jesus. The biblical terms used to describe believers are this. Disciples, slaves, servants of Christ. Listen, these seem so serious to most churchgoers that we have, ever, we have shied away from using them. And I believe we need to get back to the terms and to the expectations of God's Word for all Christians, just not some. That everyone who calls on the name of Jesus is truly a follower and a disciple of Christ and becoming like Christ. Listen, we do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, not of our own will. We do it by what God is doing in our lives. And if He's not doing anything in your life, do you truly know Him? Because listen, I, I, in my life, I, I live with this little thing called conviction. Anybody else besides me? I wish I could turn off that little voice and that tug in my heart that when I'm doing something stupid and I'm sinning, and especially when I willingly choose to do it, and I know nobody out here ever does that, okay? But listen, that's the Holy Spirit at work to create the fruits of, my, of, of the salvation that I have received through the blood of Christ. Listen, I believe the Bible is calling us to, and has always called his, the followers of Christ to a higher level of living and a higher level of learning. Not that we can flaunt it before people and our knowledge, our vast knowledge. Listen, some of the people with the most vast knowledge of the Bible are some of the meanest people I know. Anybody else know those folks? Sorry, Mark. No. <laughs> One of the kindest men I know, okay? But we, we have a common <laughs> thread. No, I'm talking about people who love and live like Christ. People that when you're around someone, you don't have to wear the shirt. You don't have to have the giant Bible. You don't have to have the bumper sticker. They see the fruits of your salvation. In everything that you do, everything that you say, everything that you are. 
and we're starting down the restarting, okay? And I've said this, down our path of our discipleship, getting that back in the place that it needs to be. I'm the one who sinned, not you, me. I own it. We're, but well, listen, when you repent, what do you do? You turn from your sin and you go the other direction. We're going the other direction. I'm just encouraging you to follow Christ. <clears throat>